Well, thank you. I very much appreciate the invitation to talk today. As you can see by my title, it's a little ambitious, right, to cover all of this in 45 minutes. Each one of these topics could take easily a half day to a full day. So my task here is really to sort of broadly cover kind of review data on what's known about these various conditions uh, and maybe plant some seeds of thought for future directions or things you should consider when you look at the literature. So just very briefly by way of background, HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders, or HAND, is still prevalent. Um, even though the treatments are much better for systemic situations and people are showing greater longevity, et cetera, we're still seeing at least mild levels of cognitive impairments. This is a study that was done by Bob Heaton a few years ago looking at a comparison of impairment rates before the advent of heart or, or a combination antiretroviral therapy and then after the initiation. The reason this was, was a, a nice study is that we did very comprehensive uh, evaluations, neuropsych evaluations, covering eight cognitive domains, both before the, the change in the different eras and then afterwards. And as you can see, what we see here is that in uh, medically asymptomatic individuals, in the CART era, we were seeing greater rates of impairment, in part because people were not getting as sick. But overall, when you look at the, the overall impairment rates, there was not a substantial change. What did change, though, was the severity of these impairments. So we're not seeing the severe dementia we used to see, et cetera. Um, and even though these are much more mild, uh, they still can have an effect on everyday functioning, looking at things such as ability to maintain active employment, adherence to medications, risky behaviors, whether they're substance use or, or risky sexual behaviors perhaps impairments on driving and uh, declines in quality of health and quality of life. In the United States, we're seeing, in essence, the greening of America, right? We're now at a point where we have 33 states that have legalized medicinal cannabis, 10 that have legalized recreational cannabis, others that have a mix of, of looking at low THC or high CBD. Uh, and it seems like every day that I want to present this slide, I have to do a double check to see if it's up to date get my many different green crayons and color it all in because everything is constantly changing. You guys, on the other hand, only need one crayon, right? Uh, and that's it, so easy for you guys to do this. Um, now we've learned a lot of the, the, the way that cannabis affects brain function. So the acute effects are pretty clear and we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, but with the discovery of the CB1 receptor, right, that's where THC binds, and then an understanding of how it is distributed throughout the brain, there's really a good one-to-one -one correlation and match between the different regions of the brain and the type of effects that people see when they're acutely high. So for example, we know that learning and memory is significantly affected. Well, there's a lot of receptors in the hippocampus. People experience some psychomotor discoordination when they're high. A lot of receptors in the cerebellum, Obviously, uh, some people become paranoid or, or develop some um, paranoia when they get, get stones, and there are a lot of receptors in the amygdala, and of course, we're familiar with the munchies, and, and, and there are a lot of receptors in the hypothalamus. So I'm going to briefly review some of the, the sort of systematic reviews that have been done looking at cognition. First, we'll look at just acute impairments. Uh, Broyd and colleagues did a review of all the literature from 2004 to 2015 and came to the conclusion that really verbal learning and memory are the most consistently affected when people get high, both in acute use and then over the, the chronic term as well. Psychomotor function is most affected during the acute intoxication period, but some residual effects may continue on over time. An important question that's not completely clear is, okay, what are the long-term effects, though? What if you take people who smoke repeatedly and for years, uh, years at a time? Um, Igor Grant, who's the director of our program and some graduate students, did a meta-analysis uh, looking at persons who are regular long-term users and then looked at effect sizes. So you're probably familiar with effect sizes, but just briefly, it sort of tells you the magnitude of the difference that you see when you compare people who are long-term users and people who are not frequent users. In general, an effect size of 0.2 is considered small. 0.5 is about medium. 0.8 is, is a, a large effect size. Those are just general terms. So they looked at the effect sizes across all of these studies. And importantly, when they did this analysis, they made sure that there was a comparison group of people who were either not users or people who used other substances but used very little of them. 
They identified 15 studies covering about 1,200 participants, including a fairly good sized sample of people who are regular users of cannabis. Here's what they found. They looked at eight cognitive domains. So verbal language domain, reaction time, perceptual motor skills, motor functioning, learning and memory or forgetting, attention, and then executive functioning as well. This is showing the effect size. Zero means there's no effect. Uh, again, about a 0.2 would be a small effect size, and, and the further you get down, the larger the effect size. The first thing to note is that there were not a lot of large effects across most of these domains. The one that was really most affected was learning and forgetting, and it was a, a fairly small effect size of about 0.2. Okay? So when you look at people who have been using for a long time, we're not seeing ongoing chronic cognitive problems. This study was then followed up by a study by Schreiner and Dunn, who then also were very interested in, well, what if you look at people who've been abstinent for a while? So they had cited Pope in noting that a lot of the problems with studies, even the ones that, that Igor did, was well, sometimes it's hard to control for all these other variables, et cetera, and quite often they don't really take into consideration how long were people abstinent. So it's possible that people could have residual effects from long-term use because it's still in the system or their body hasn't reacclimated if they just were absent in a couple days. But if they've been absent, been out, absent in a month or so, maybe there's a different uh, picture that we gain. So Schreiner and Dunn took Igor's criteria and then updated it with the different studies that had taken place in the 10 years since that study. Uh, and also focused on looking at studies in addition to the, the greater uh, amount of studies that looked at um, chronic use looked at those that really looked at abstinence in particular. And here's what they found. So first let's just look at the blue item here. So this is the 33 studies. And as you can see, the effect sizes are, are pretty small, but there are significant effects uh, in terms of worse performance in people who are long-term users across most domains. So they were seeing small effect size, but pretty consistent. They then pulled out those 13 studies in which people had confirmed abstinence for at least 25 days. That's in yellow. And as you can see, basically all of them crossed zero in terms of effect size. So once you looked at people who'd been absent for about a month, the effects went away, indicating that there may be some residual effects. But for most people, once you stop, your brain recovers and, and you're usually functioning with the normal range. And here's what it looks like when you aggregate all of the different cognitive tests together into a global score. Again, when you look at the blue, there's a significant effect. When you look at people who stopped smoking or stopped using for about a month, that effect goes away. So we see what happens with acute. We see what happens with people who are long-term and stop. Of course, the ideal would be, well, let's test people before they start smoking, test people after, after they've been smoking for a while, and then we'll get a better understanding of the effects that, that cannabis has on cognition. So Raul Gonzalez uh, down in Florida did a study of uh, looking at all those different projects that had looked at people before they started cannabis and afterwards. First of all, there are not many of those. I think there were like five when I added them up. Uh, and what they found was that there was an effect of cannabis initiation. Again, the effects were fairly small. The effect size was really about 0.2 to 0.5. Um, and really when they looked at the data in great de detail, the real effect you're seeing are then the heaviest users. So a lot of these studies, it's, it's those people that are really dedicated users who are showing the greatest cognitive effects. And usually, because of the distribution, it's a small <laughs> sample and a small proportion of the studies. So a lot of these findings are based on a small a number of people. Um, and what they also found was once you start looking at confounding variables, again, things like age and ethnicity and, and concurrent use of other substances, et cetera, a lot of these effects went away uh, when you controlled for those. So they made a particular point in saying that when we look at these types of studies, we really need to be able to look at these third variables such as psychiatric conditions or mental health issues, uh, other substance use, when we're gonna analyze whether or not the initiation of cannabis results in worse cognition. Uh, they also made the point that quite often these studies are done in generally healthy populations. We don't know much about vulnerable populations. Uh, and all these studies are typically done with the cannabis that's, you know, was from 10 years ago, not the, the current cannabis products that are out there. 
an issue of tolerance, of course, is, is high in everyone's mind, so to speak. Um, this is just an example of one study that looked at people who were frequent users, obviously a very small sample, but 12 people who were frequent users, 12 people who were infrequent users, and gave them uh, a critical tracking task, which is sort of a, uh, a motor task where, say, you have a joystick and you have to keep a dot over a, a moving target or whatever. So it's fairly complex, but it's, it's somewhat automatic and so forth. And what we see here is that when you had the people who were occasional users in black, they did significantly worse. So this is an hour, three hours, five hours after they smoked. Those people were just occasional users, did really poorly on this. Those people who were heavy users, did about the same as when they had placebo. Uh, and here's a divided attention, sort of how accurate they were, and you see the same effect, that again, it's people who are just occasional users that are really seeing the biggest uh, bump. Uh, in terms of cognition when it comes time uh, to look at their performance. Khaleesi and their colleagues then did a review of all the studies that are out there. In this case, they looked at 38 studies or 36 studies looking at uh, the impact of tolerance and frequent use. Uh, here you can see the definitions of how they broke people into regular, not regular users. It really is, is a fairly challenging um, definition to use is you, if you find, if you look at the literature, people use a lot of different, de different definitions of what's frequent, what's chronic, what's heavy and so forth. Uh, and I was chatting with people yesterday that even in our studies when we start looking at, okay, what's the definition of someone who's a heavy user, do we go with frequency? So if we go, oh my gosh, five or six days a week, that's a pretty heavy user. Well, that sort of dates back to the, the earlier area when we considered cannabis to be a hard drug and you know it's heroin or methamphetamine. You know, if you in the audience after work go home and smoke a joint after work each day rather than have a glass of wine or whatever, do we really consider you a heavy frequent chronic user uh, or should it really be a definition based upon your exposure to the, to the substance? Which it should, but we often don't collect that, that kind of data in many of the studies that take place. So in their review, they found that people who were regular users, for the most part, had less prominent or almost no effects on cognition when you did testing, especially if you did repeated testing with them. So tolerance certainly develops to the cognitive aspects. Uh, some people th think that motor impulsivity uh, may still be affected in things like this critical tracking task. But for the most part, they're not seeing uh, the amount of cognitive impairment that you see in an infrequent user. They also found blunting and a lot of the other physiological effects of people using cannabis. Um, anyway, How about CBD? So certainly the lore out there is that, well, if you take some CBD with your THC, it may uh, affect the binding of THC. Really, when I look at the literature, at least, I think it's pretty mixed in terms of whether or not that's actually true. And this could be, as with so many studies, uh, a result of kind of the methods that are used. Some people use intravenous, you know, THC. Some people administer CBD an hour before they take the THC. Some people do it concurrently. But, but in general, I think uh, it'd be hard to make a convincing statement that right now, if you put CBD in with THC, you're going to cut down the psychoactive effects of THC. So when we try to look at cognition, uh, again, we're very familiar with what the acute effects are, but there are a lot of challenges in looking at these studies. One of is that they're primarily all smoked um, and usually on low dose THC because they've occurred you know, five or 10 years ago. Uh, one thing that is quite challenging in these studies and, and we're finding also in the case of our driving studies is that you really need to pay attention to smoking topography. So if you give everyone the same person a joint they're often going to get different levels of THC into their system, right? Some people are going to inhale deeply, especially the, the more frequent users, and they're going to probably hold it in longer. And so the frequent users may get higher plasma THC levels in their blood, but get less high. Um, some people will barely smoke. Some will be Bill Clinton and not inhale or whatever. And you're going to end up with people who, even though you say, okay, I'm going to do a study looking at the effect of cannabis on cognition, if you give a joint, that doesn't necessarily mean they all got the same dosing. So it's important to, to do things like blood levels very soon after they smoke to see, well, how much did they really take in? Uh, we also find that users self-titrate. So 
you know, a, a very hot topic, certainly in the States, is the high level of THC that's available now in cannabis, up to 25% in, in plant material. Um, just because you can go out and get Bacardi 151 or get a super high content alcohol doesn't mean all of you are going to go out and do that, that you really want to get completely blitzed on alcohol. And that's the same with cannabis. There may be high levels of THC in the cannabis. Be people may smoke half the joint or whatever. People often self-titrate to the level of high that they want. Uh, and then, of course, you need to take into consideration use and tolerance when you do any kind of analyses on the effects that people uh, experience in terms of cognition and driving performance and so forth. So this, this graph right here is just showing the THC levels of cannabis that was confiscated by the federal government. So back in 95, is about 4%. In 2014, it was up about 12%. So it's showing the sort of the constant climb in terms of what's out there. Now, of course, with dispensary and artis uh, you know, artisans who are doing cultivation and so forth, again, people are reporting much higher levels in plant material. So we know that HIV obviously can affect cognition. We know that cannabis can impair cognition. So it seems pretty obvious. You put these two bad things together, you're going to end up with impairment. It's not so straightforward. Uh, so here's just a couple examples from the same study group of results they found. So in the case of, again, individuals with HIV who are using cannabis, uh, April Thames and her group at UCLA found that at low levels of cannabis, that's below one and a half grams per week, the HIV positive users did worse uh, than the, or the HIV negative, or HIV positive users did worse than the non-users, okay? However, at higher levels, there was no difference in cognition, okay? So a little bit was not having much effect. Higher levels, they weren't seeing any difference. They did another study in which they had HIV-positive light users who did actually better than the HIV-negative light users on cognition. And in this case, moderate to heavy HIV-positive users did worse on learning memory than the HIV-negative moderate users. So it's very confused and very mixed in terms of, well, what is the real impact? But we're not seeing an obvious sort of additive effect like you might see with you know, alcohol plus cannabis. In this case, you have cognitive impairment plus cannabis, and it's not so clear that we're seeing uh, worse performance. And then there was another study that looked at cannabis use with a brief screening tool as well as self-reported, and they found no increased impairment on this very brief screening tool, the MOCA. Um, in HIV positive cannabis, HIV positive cannabis users, but found some self-reported cognitive problems, but they also failed to see this additive effect. So what's going on here? In part, you're going to see, I think, a lot of presenters at the end of the day who are going to talk about anti-inflammatory uh, effects and neuroprotective. So is it possible that maybe cannabis might be helpful for some people uh, in terms of brain function when you have sort of ongoing inflammation uh, from HIV. So is it possible that perhaps at low levels you don't get much effect, at moderate use of THC maybe it downregulates and takes care of some of the inflammation and then maybe at high levels you get the impairment due to cannabis? Well, that could be the case. So this is some preliminary data coming out of our HIV research center. In this case, we took about 700 people, a subset who smoked cannabis uh, and looked at their cognitive, cognitive performance in a cross-sectional design. So when we do cognitive testing, we do a pretty comprehensive job. We do about eight cognitive domains, takes a couple hours of testing, uh, and then we put it into something we call the Global Deficit Score, the GDS. So it's a way of, it's not using a mean T-score, an average score, it's actually a, a way of weighting impaired performance. Because one, one problem, when, you encounter when you do studies and you average things out is you could have someone who's doing really poorly in one domain and doing okay in the other and then they wash out and you it looks like they're doing okay the way this global deficit score works is it weights those really bad performances so in multiple studies we've done it really relates well to level of cognitive impairment when a clinician looks at how they're doing So on the left-hand side here, we have GDS. A GDS of 0.5 is our typical cut point for impairment. Here we have people who are naive and frequent users, moderate users, and then frequent users. So this is you know, a couple times a month at the most. This was, I think, about 10 days a month, and this is about daily use. 
the, the bars are showing the GDS score. So as you can see, those people who did not use often had high GDS scores indicating worse cognitive performance. It actually dropped in the moderate users. It was lower. And then in the frequent users, it was up high again. And when we break those groups out by impairment using this 0.5 cut point, we see about half the people who were naive or infrequent users were impaired, about 35% of moderate users, and then back up to 50%. So it's a preliminary study, but it is consistent with the notion that perhaps cannabis has some beneficial effects on the brain, uh, at least for people who have active inflammation taking place. We also did a study that came out recently from uh, a graduate student and uh, being mentored by David Moore who looked at something that they call super aging. So in this case, the notion is that you take people who are 55 and above, but if you look at their cognitive tests, they're performing like someone who's 25, right? We do uh, demographic adjustments based on age, education, and, and ethnicity and all of those, but they're getting T-scores that would indicate that they're about, they're functioning like a 25-year-old. We looked at that in comparison to those people who were 55 and above and were cognitively normal for their age, so they were in the expected range, and those people who were cognitively impaired. And then they take a look, took a look to see whether or not there were specific predictors in terms of how people did with respect to super aging, you know, looking really good for their age. Uh, the RAT is the wide range achievement test. It's, it's a reading test that basically sort of gets at pre-morbid functioning. Reading usually doesn't decline with HIV, so if if you do pretty well on that test, it usually means you either were well-educated or even if you weren't well-educated in school, you have good sort of verbal IQ. We have cannabis use disorder, age, uh, depression on the Beck depression inventory, and then diabetes. Uh, these indicate that it's predictive, uh, an increased odds ratio that you're going to be a superager. These are negative factors, so increased age, depression, and diabetes all tended to show, implicate you in have, being impaired compared to superagers. In this case though, if we look at the yellow lines, the cannabis use disorder, actually it was a, a positive predictor of being a superager, that those people who had used a fair amount of cannabis actually were young at heart, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, or young in the brain, let's put it that way. So, you know, now, you know, circular, which comes first, who knows, but in this case, you know, through a fairly complex analysis, they found that fairly frequent cannabis use was associated with being sort of more cognitively intact. <coughs> so there you go. So that's not a prescription for you guys, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so what does it all matter? I mean, sort of who, who cares if you do all this cognitive testing and you find these impairments, if they're not having real world impact, they may not be of much importance. So one thing I'm particularly interested in is automobile driving uh, because it's really one of clearly the most dangerous of everyday activities we all engage in. It certainly could be affected by various <laughs> cognitive factors uh, that impact uh, your ability to do this, such as ability to maintain a, attention, visual uh, scanning, using judgment, et cetera. Um, certainly in the States, it's critical for quality of life and you know, even more so than the olden days, even if you do hands-free cell phones, right now there's just increasing amount of multitasking that's taking place. So it seems like a particularly risky behavior to engage in. Uh, I've done some studies in the past looking at HIV, uh, showing that HIV-associated cognitive impairment is associated with worse driving performance. In this case, we took people and put them on a couple driving simulators. One. Uh, we called routine emergency driving. So you drive through the city, you have to do some crash avoidance, you have to go through some yellow lights and so forth. Uh, and we looked at the amount of crashes you had on the simulation. We also had a simulation that we called the virtual city. So we give someone a map, say, okay, find your way to this location, then turn around and come back. We, you can look at the map, you don't have to memorize it, but you have to drive your way through this virtual city. And then we actually took people out on the road uh, we took some certified driving rehab instructors, did about a 30 minute drive across freeways and through residential and business districts and see how, saw how they did. So here we're looking at simulator crashes, navigational errors on the virtual city and failing the on-road drive. In green are HIV negative individuals, in blue are HIV positive individuals who are cognitively normal. 
Uh, and then in the orangish color are those who are cognitively impaired. And as you can see here, those who had cognitive impairment, these are people with current licenses and currently driving. They had significantly more crashes on the simulator, greater difficulty in doing navigation, and failed this on-road drive at a significantly higher rate. Okay? So it wasn't universal for people who were living with HIV, but those people were showing cognitive impairment. Now this was in an early era. This was about 10 years ago. Now uh, the question is, well, what's happening now in the era of good treatments? Is, is this gone away? These are some data from a study we just completed looking at older individuals living with HIV. Uh, sample size was 42 HIV negatives, 24 HIV positive, the mean age, about 60. And this was a very simple task. We just wanted people to be able to sit at a simulator as a single screen and the task is you drive straight down the road, you maintain your speed, you maintain your lane position, and then in the corner of the screen are some divided attention tasks. So if you see a left triangle, you have to, you have to hit the left turn signal. If you see a horn, you have to press the horn. Uh, and what we look at is, okay, how well and how efficiently do you do that task? When you're doing it, do you start swerving a lot, which people tend to find on some of these studies? Uh, do you, does your speed speed up and slow down? Do you have a lot of deviation? Or do you do the task less well? Are you more likely to miss uh, the stimuli or incorrectly respond? What this shows is that when comparing people living with HIV or HIV negatives, the amount of swerving was exactly the same. They both maintain sort of safe, safe position on the roadway. But what we did see in those people who were HIV positive, a significantly greater likelihood that they were gonna hit one of the wrong stimuli. So if it showed a horn, they hit the turn signal. Now, it wasn't a huge effect, right? We're seeing on average about maybe one error uh, on the drive, but it was significant, indicating that perhaps there's at least still some subtle uh, issues going on with these individuals. We also took a subset of these people out on the road. This was just a, a year or two ago. Again, this is like a 30 minute drive. It's a fairly long drive. We have two evaluators who independently rate how the person's doing. We take them through complex uh, cityscapes in the real world, uh, and then ultimately have the raters come up with a consensus score. And what this shows is that the HIV positive individuals had significantly higher number of errors during this on-road drive as well. Again, it's not a huge number though, it's significant, but it is indicating perhaps there's some subtle issues still going on. What we didn't see is what we saw earlier where in the earlier study, people were failing. It was like the examiner saying this person should not be driving. In this case, we had none of those cases, but we did see subtle differences. So things seem to get better. Uh, it seems to be consistent with the notion that um, impairments still may be prevalent, but they're nowhere near as severe as they used to be uh, in the previous era. So this is uh, a study, the study we did was with, you know, sort of the community lay people. Uh, there's a really interesting project going on with Heta Hosa in South Africa, she has a K award that I'm a mentor on, and she's actually looking at logistics drivers and taxi and Uber drivers, so people who are doing delivery service who are professional drivers. So given the high rate of HIV in South Africa, we want to see, well, how does it look in people who are professional drivers? Do they have this reserve that they're so good at their jobs it really doesn't affect their ability to do um, safe driving and, and see how they do on the simulator? Uh, or are there problems taking place? So this study is currently underway and we're really interested in seeing what the results will be. Um, but it's really novel because so many of our studies, especially at the HNRC, we, we look at people and we say, okay, we wanna do uh, two or three days of testing on you, right? Thanks for coming in. Well, trying to find people who are high functioning, employed and all of that is difficult. In her case, she's actually going out and finding people who are actively employed in this profession uh, and seeing how HIV may or may not affect their performance. Okay, I said I'd cover a lot of areas here. So, cannabis and driving. What do we know about uh, cannabis and driving? So we know the cognitive effects pretty consistently. When you take simulator and controlled studies, people tend to swerve a little more when they're under the influence. They show poor um, and delayed uh, reaction time, so it takes longer to hit the brakes. They tend to have increased difficulty doing judgment of speed and distances, and it tends to be dose dependent. The higher you get them, the worse they do. The actual results when it comes to epidemiologic findings is pretty mixed. So the, the state experience is unclear in the states that have legalized it. 
Uh, we did have one study that showed about a 6% increase in insurance claims uh, when they legalize it. We do know that cannabis effects get amplified by alcohol. It's not really clear whether it's additive or synergistic, right? <laughs> Is one plus one equals one, two or one plus one equals three? Uh, and we know that cannabis is very different than alcohol when it comes to behavioral outcomes, right? People who are stoned, on average, tend to be more likely to consider themselves to be impaired, tend to be more cautious, are less likely to pass cars in front of them, um, tend to drive more slowly, uh, very different than what experienced with alcohol in terms of sort of recklessness, uh, poor judgment, et cetera. We've looked at sort of the experience of places like Colorado and Washington when they've legalized. And you know, it seems just so obvious that if you take an impairing drug and you legalize it and let people you know, start using it more frequently, you're gonna have bad outcomes. And that was what was found uh, in 2017 by this Rocky Mountain sort of high, high intensity sort of drug study that took place. And they came out in 2017 and said marijuana-related traffic deaths, deaths more than doubled in the state of Colorado from 2013 to 2016. So it was a huge negative impact. But in that same year, the American Journal of Public Health came out with a study stating that three years after recreational marijuana legalization, changes in motor vehicle crash rates for Washington and Colorado were not statistically different from states without legislation. Okay, but <laughs> last year, Nevada came out and said traffic deaths in Nevada dropped by 10% once they legalized recreational cannabis. So it's all over the place. Now, why are we seeing these discrepancies in these reports? I mean, it's crazy, and part of them, I think, occasionally are politically driven, uh, but there are a number of sort of statistical reasons why we're finding this. One is when you look at fatalities and crash rates, most everyone requires on something in the states called the FARS, the Fatality uh, Accident Reporting System. And it is extremely flawed system. It's nationwide, but the, the people who contribute it to are sort of scattershot. You don't know uh, what labs are measuring for. Uh, they have different criteria for cutoffs. They have different machinery, et cetera. So even NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, in the states has said you should not use FARS data for any of these types of analyses. People keep publishing on it, and anytime you see any study talking about fatality crash rates, you need to keep in mind that it's very likely that the data they use is probably not appropriate for that kind of analysis. Uh, it's also very po possible that when we look at studies that look at what are the odds ratios of people getting in crashes if they have THC in their system, that those are really getting diluted by the fact that, as was commented, by Sherry earlier, it hangs around for a long time in your system. So when you compare people who got in crashes and people who didn't get in crashes, it gets watered down by the fact that you're drawing blood from a lot of people who are not impaired. Um, so a, a recent study out of NHTSA said that the odds ratio of being in a crash with TH in your system was one, which basically means there's no effect. So that was a major finding. It was surprising that the federal government come out and say that. Um, the problem is, as long as you're looking at THC in blood, which we'll talk about in a second, you're just not going to get good data. We also may see this difference in what we see in the lab versus the real world in that uh, quite often in the real world, people have other drugs on board. It's very rare to sort of have a lot of crash reporting with THC only. It's possible that people who are high do these other compensatory behaviors, right? They slow down, they're more cautious, so maybe that lessens the risk of sort of the cognitive impairment affecting their ability to drive. And then an important one is that it's very possible that the magnitude of the effects we see in our simulator studies may not translate to the real world. So this is just an example of a study I did. Uh, I know there was talk, uh, Dr. Gulati had talked about MS spasticity. So we did this study at the CMCR where we took 30 people, generally women in their 50s, who had MS that was intractable and still problematic for them. Treated them with cannabis, and there was a significant effect that over the course of three days, their spasticity uh, got much better. I was interested in, well, what are the cognitive effects of that, and what are the driving effects on that? So we did a driving simulator study, similar to the ones I've discussed before, 
And in this case, we're looking at swerving. So as they're doing this divided attention task, how much are they swerving down the road? When we look at people when they're on cannabis versus on placebo, again, these are MS patients, this is the effect size we saw about three hours after they dosed. This is about 4% THC. So they had clinical benefit from this, but about three hours, we're seeing an effect size of about 0.4, again, sort of mid-range. So clearly there's something going on here and um, it's significant, right? So even three hours after using a low dose. But I was also interested in, well, how does this compare to other medications? Because one thing you've probably learned or you will learn is, boy, people are really interested in the cognitive effects of cannabis. And they will do it to the exclusion of all the other cognitive effects we know that happen with prescription medications. Uh, but they'll really zero in on, on what happens with cannabis. So I looked at other studies that have looked at swerving uh, with prescription medications. Now, these weren't exactly the same uh, methods, so they might have done this on the road, uh, and they might have done it for a longer period of time. Ours was only a seven-minute study, so it was very brief because of the type of clinical trial it was. But ours also involved divided attention tasks. Most just drive straight down the road. And here are the effect sizes we saw for these other medications. So if, if your patient started an antidepressant a couple days ago, they're two days into starting their antidepressant, this is the level of swerving that was reported by investigators. So it's about the same, if not slightly higher, than you saw with cannabis. Boy, if any of you had trouble sleeping last night and took a long-acting Ambien this morning at 10 a.m., this is the level of swerving you would, be, you would have. So Ambien even comes with a warning. You really shouldn't, if you're doing long acting, you really shouldn't do any machinery the whole next day. No one follows that, but it's, it's actually an FDA warning. Uh, here's the effect size for, canna or for alcohol. Uh, here's one hour after taking a Xanax. So this is not to say, hey, look, it's just as bad as everything else. But I think as we look at these studies, both the studies we do and other people do, you need to keep in mind, well, what's the actual magnitude of the effect and how much increased risk is there compared to using other medications? So lastly, I just want to touch upon the detection of acute intoxication. So uh, as Sherry commented, if you're going to have people who are medicinal users, they should be aware of what the risks are, how people might identify whether or not they're impaired, and how accurate that's going to be. So one of the ideals would be to have a per se law, right? So in the, in the alcohol fields, 0 0.05, 0 0.08, or whatever, it's readily accepted that, okay, if you're above that, that level, you should not be driving. And boy, it would be ideal to come up with the same thing for cannabis. Either you could draw blood or take uh, swabs from the mouth. Um, this is the part in my presentations where I say the problem is it doesn't work. But since you guys have made the decision that you're going with per se laws, I'll just say the problem is it's problematic <laughs> to do per se laws. Uh, and I'll show you in a minute why. But here's, I believe, your, your Canadian laws, which is saying if you're two to five nanograms, you get a fine. If it's greater than five nanograms, these are blood drawn after a couple hours, you get sort of increasing level of offenses every single time you get pulled over and get that uh, blood drawn. And then if you do this combination of relatively low THC and alcohol, you uh, have a, a much more severe fine. Okay? And this is sort of reflecting an earlier study I, I didn't show you, but studies have shown that when you combine cannabis and alcohol, it's you you do almost as bad as you are at 0.08, even if your blood alcohol level is below 0.08. So here's some of the reasons why this is problematic. So this was a study that was done out of Washington. They took 600 drivers, all who were determined to be impaired, too impaired to be on the road, and we knew it was due to cannabis only. And then they looked at the blood levels of THC. Here's you know, one up to 25, so these are the different levels. And this is the percent of that whole group that fell into that level of THC. So all of these added up equal 100%. Then they looked at the median value of THC in the blood of these people, again, 600 people determined to be impaired drivers, and the median THC level was five, right? So half the drivers, by the time the blood was drawn, which often takes an hour or two, half the drivers who the cops said were really impaired would fall below the five nanogram cut point. So I know in the states where they've said, hey, this is a great idea, let's do a per se law, it'll make it simple. Most of the prosecutors bemoan the fact that they have a per se law, 
because now rather than saying, hey, they're above five nanograms, they're impaired, they're spending their time saying, this person was too impaired to be driving, and I know they're below five nanograms, but that really doesn't matter because they were impaired. So it's really been problematic in that you could have a low THC level and be impaired. Conversely, as Sherry had commented, if you're a regular user, THC hangs around for a long time. So this was a study that Marilyn Hustis's group did where they hospitalized people, they monitored them, made sure that they didn't use cannabis. And this is just looking over the first seven days of admission into the hospital. And as you can see, a fairly high proportion of these individuals, even seven days out, were still showing THC levels uh, at the one to two <laughs> nanogram range. So when you look at THC levels, you can have be low and be impaired, or you can be low and probably not be impaired at all. Because typically, the, the period of impairment is probably two to six hours. This is probably the, the one take-home slide I would recommend that you memorize, because it's a, a terrific slide done by one of our consultants, Marilyn Hustis. I think she did this as her PhD dissertation 20 years ago. But it really shows how THC works in the blood. So on the bottom is THC levels in the blood. On the y-axis is basically how high are you? compared to before you smoked. And then this goes in a counterclockwise direction. So here's 1.8 minutes, four and a half minutes, about 10 to 12 minutes, 45 minutes, up to 12 hours. And what you can see when someone smokes, the THC level goes up very quickly in their blood. And this also sort of matches up with getting high. So during that first 10 minutes, THC is going up, they're getting high, and it's all kind of going together. Almost like you see with alcohol, you're seeing that nice linear effect. But very quickly, the THC then distributes. And it may go to your brain, it goes to other to fat cells. And so over the next hour or so, your THC is just plummeting in your blood. It's getting much slower, but you're staying high for those couple hours. So you're still cognitively impaired or you're high, but very low THC levels. And then once you hit a couple hours out, the highness starts wearing off and you know, you're starting to feel normal again, except that THC is still hanging around in your blood. So you can have very high levels of THC and be pretty stoned. You can also have very low levels of THC and still be stoned. And you can have very low levels of THC and not be stoned. So the, the notion of, hey, we're gonna use a per se law that's gonna create a cut point really is, again, I say problem, problematic. Trying to get around the issue of looking at blood, because it takes an hour and a half to get it drawn, at least in the States, is let's just do a, a oral swab. You know, right? We have good swabs that will detect THC. And so the notion being that, hey, a cop at the roadside can go ahead and swab it, see that you have THC in your system, and know that you recently smoked. The problem with that is, is at least some studies have shown that that oral swab may actually be detecting THC that was more than a few hours ago. So this is a study down here. We see the number of hours since smoking. Here's the THC level in the oral swab. Here's a five nanogram cut point. This is, uh, this is the cut point that a, a tool such as the Draeger, which is a commonly used oral fluid measure uses. They use a cut point of above or below five nanograms. And what you can see is about 10 hours out, this is kind of the median value and then the interquartile range. About 10 hours out, half the people are still coming up greater than five nanograms on that swab. Now it's very likely that they're probably not impaired at that point, but it's still gonna show that they've used and they've used, you know, who knows, maybe in a couple hours, but maybe many hours ago. So I'm just gonna very briefly wrap up by, by talking about a study we have going on in San Diego. So we were funded to look at the impact of cannabis on driving. The study is looking at different doses, looking at the time course um, since you smoked, looking at whether you can use oral fluid or breath um, to determine when someone last smoked or whether they're impaired and seeing whether or not we can create some standardized tablets that get at the cognitive effects. Because one thing that happens in these field sobriety tests is that they really look at sort of physiological responses to drugs and THC is very much more a cognitive measure. In the field sobriety tests, the measure of, uh, of divided attention is that you put your feet together, you tilt your head back, and you tell the examiner when 30 seconds is up. So that's the extent of the cognitive uh, 
challenge that's put forth to people during the field sobriety test. We want to see, hey, can we do some measures that look at things such as learning and memory and, and uh, motor tracking to see if those help identify people who are too impaired to drive. So we're just actually finishing up this study in the next month. We're looking at 180 people. We're getting placebo from NIDA. So NIDA is the only source to get cannabis in the States. Uh, they take their cannabis and they extract the THC from it so that it's uh, a truly a 0% THC cigarette. We're looking at 5.9%. We're really lucky because right when we started the study, they got up to growing better pot and they're at 13.4%. All the previous studies tended to be at 4 or 6%. And then throughout the course of the day, we do driving simulations. We actually have the instructors for our DRE program. So DRE are the drug recognition experts. Uh, I think the Royal County Mount Police, they, they have a, you have a strong program here in Canada as well. But there's, there's sort of the creme de la creme of people who identify impaired driving. They kind of do a mini neurologic exam when they look at individuals. So we have their instructors actually coming down and during the course of the day, doing about four field sobriety test assessments. Uh, then we're looking at all of these fluids and we're looking at how the people perform on these cognitive tests. And so I just give you a couple examples of the simulations. What we're trying to do is go beyond just the swerving and the divided attention to try to address things that we think will be meaningful. So I love that I can get nice scores with my swerving, but again, I'm not sure it always translates into real world risks. So we put people through a lot of different scenarios. Um, <coughs> from residential areas to construction zones. We have some uh, crash avoidance tasks. So in this case, we're thinking the driver's eyes may be pulled over to the truck to the side of the road and not realize that someone's crossing the roadway. To the far right lane and take the freeway exit. So pretty complex task is getting onto freeways, merging with traffic, and then trying to get all the way across to the other side. Uh, so we do a number of these during each simulation. In talking to the cops, they also said, hey, if you want to see where people are at highest risk of getting a crash, you do it during freeway exiting when you're going 65 miles an hour and all of a sudden you have to slow down and get off the freeway. So we added those types of components. And we want to get it distracted driving. So in this case, she's driving down the road. She hears the phone ring and she has to touch this iPad and identify the circle that's different than all of the others. The other divided task I've talked about were always on the screen. In this case, they need to take their eyes off the road. We have left turn challenges because there's, you know, as we said, time estimation distance gets a little disturbed by cannabis. Uh, and so we built this into the system. That was a late addition to our project because we had a lot of people who just sat there and waited and waited and waited. Um, it, it, was a, it was actually happenstance that we had someone who was pretty stoned and she was like, the car just happened to pull up behind her and say, oh my God, they're getting angry, I better go. And it's like, it's a simulation. And so that's, <laughs> then we turned around and I added in the horn because after about 15 seconds, it's like, okay, let's get going here, so. But the whole idea here is really to, to kind of merge experimental studies, but also try to get something that ultimately has real world translation, right? So we're not just looking for the sensitivity, oh, does cannabis affect this thing, the, you know, this certain ability, but does it affect enough to really put you at risk? Now this study is just looking at smoked cannabis. And that's really, you know, we can, as Dr. Gulati mentioned, we might be able to bake some brownies, but we really don't have access to any of the products that are being sold in California. They're all federally illegal, so the best we could do would be to buy some uh, plant material from NIDA and bake our own brownies, which we probably will do in the near future. Um, but edibles are really interesting to me because it's very different effect. So in, you remember what the graph looked like uh, for smoking. With edibles, actually you don't get high from THC. It actually goes through your system, goes through your liver, and gets converted into something called 11-hydroxy. And that's what gets you stoned. It's not the THC. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the fact that it may take an hour or two for that to take effect, and like the almost instantaneous the effect you get from smoking. And then the high tends to last for, for many hours. Okay, so this one, this one did not like converting to, I'll describe it, converting to PC. But what this graph shows is that when you smoke, just like the graph I showed you, THC goes up really quickly and drops. 11-hydroxy doesn't even bump up 
when you smoke because it doesn't occur from smoking, it occurs from your liver uh, changing the THC. When you take an edible, the THC level barely bumps up. That's not what's getting you high. What you see is the increase in 11 hydroxy over the first hour or two when someone takes an edible and then you see it go out for like five or six hours and then it tails off and that's when the high stops. Uh, so it's a very different mechanism, a different kind of high, I think some people will say, certainly a different pattern on how it works. Um, so that's something we're all very interested in, in pursuing uh, once the federal government lets us start doing it. Um, so just in summary, HIV cognitive issues are still uh, prevalent. We know that cannabis affects cognition acutely. Actually, the long-term effects are not so clear. It appears actually that most people recover whenever they stop smoking. Um, it's certainly hypothetical that cannabis may be of benefit in terms of cognition and brain function in people who have an active inflammatory condition. It's very early studies. One, one thing you'll learn in cannabis studies is you can never count on one or two studies to be definitive. There are just so many variables involved that each study will give a little added information, but nothing gives you the, the full truth in, in at least just one study. So I think some of the, the speakers later this afternoon are talking about anti-inflammatory, all of that, but it may have benefit for the central nervous system. Uh, and while both HIV and cannabis can affect driving, to my knowledge, there's no studies that have looked at the combined effects on driving performance. And then, of course, as we consider future studies, we really needed to take in consideration uh, the potential tolerance that people develop, what kind of dosing you're gonna do, and then what is the method of administration, uh, whether it's edibles or smoked versions or dabbing at some point and so forth. So, so anyway, so that's it. These are our collaborators, um, the investigators on the left. These are all the cops who come down and have done the field sobriety test for our study. And thank you for your time. Thank you.